trouble. And the Lord knows that. And he said, it, it, in, his, in his presence is the fullness of joy. So welcome to the pot shop. Yeah. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1. At the potter's house. <sighs> verse 1. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house. And there I will give you my message. So I went to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot, somebody say the pot. The pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, somebody say pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Verse 5, then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord. Like the clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you in the next few minutes, God, that you would illuminate your heart to each and every one of us of what you're doing in this season. God, we thank you for your spirit, and we thank you for your power. We thank you for revelation to flow out of this house. God, let me get out of your way, and you have your way in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Welcome to the pot shop. Now, I love Jeremiah because the prophet Jeremiah uses a lot of imagery. If you've ever read the, the prophet Jeremiah, some people refer to him as the weeping prophet because he used all kinds of pictures to try to get Israel's attention and try to turn them back to God and start worshiping false gods and start wor stop worshiping idols. And God would speak to him through some really great pictures. One of them being Jeremiah 18, 1, when he says, go down to the potter's house, and there you will see the potter shaping, shaping a pot out of clay, and God begins to speak to him about he, how he is the potter, and we are the clay. And I love what this portrays what God is like as the potter. How many know that's God that shapes nations? I know that God is the one shaping governments. God is the one shaping your life. God is the one shaping your destiny. God is the one shaping this church. God is the one shaping what's happening in America. God is the potter and we are the clay. And I love how, how this portrays God as the potter because it means that I don't have to shape myself. Come on, has anybody but me ever tried to work yourself over? Get some hairspray. <laughs> Give yourself a makeover. Just work really hard on yourself and, and, and do the best you can do. But it is exhausting to think that you're going to shape yourself into what God's called you to be. God sees something when he looks at you. When he starts shaping your clay, he's not just guessing. He's not just smacking a little clay on there and pouring a little water on there and say, well, I hope this turns out all right. They say that Michelangelo, the great sculptor, when he would sculpt something, you know, sculpt these beautiful marble statues and, and, and different things, that he had, they say, do you just, you just chip at that away until, until, you, until you get the angel? And he said, no, I see the angel in the marble, and then I just work until I set him free. God sees something in you from the time you were created in your mother's womb, even before the foundation of the world, God had you in mind. And he sees you as the way he designs you to be, be, be before sin even entered the world. So when he slaps you onto that potter's wheel, he knows exactly what he is shaping you into. And my friends, it is magnificent. It is marvelous what he's shaping each of us into. It is with great care that he is pouring his thoughts and his love, and his anointing, and his power as he shapes you on that potter's wheel. And if you notice, it says in the scripture that, there was, that, the, that the pot was marred in his hands. Everybody say the pot. The pot was marred in his hands. If you look that up, marred actually means disfigure. So he sees this something disfigured as he's working on your pot. He didn't, notice he didn't say he was the one that disfigured it. How many know you can get disfigured just going to Walmart? <laughs> you can get a little out of joint, a little disfigured, just by three people calling you on the phone this week. 
You can get a little disfigured by how you were raised as a child and, and wounded in your past. A divorce can disfigure you. It hurts. It's painful. Notice it was not the potter that disfigured the pot. He just found that it was disfigured in his hands. Something disfigured it. Maybe it was your upbringing. Maybe it was the person that abandoned you. Maybe it was the person that verbally abused you. But something he finds marred or disfigured while he's shaping the pot. And I love this about God because what does he do? Oh, this is disfigured right here. He doesn't throw the pot out. He doesn't just throw the whole lump of clay. He just says, no, all right, I'm just going to form myself a, a brand new pot. Amen. How many of you are glad that God didn't get up, give up on you because you were a little disfigured? Because you were a little messed up. Do you know we're all a little messed up? If you are not a little bit of messed up, you are probably in the wrong house today. We want all the messed up people to come in here and get on the potter's wheel and stay until you see what you're supposed to be made into. <laughs> come on, my ministry started in the mental hospital. I love telling people that, and you just hear people look at me like, are you kidding me? No, my ministry started in the mental hospital. 21, 22 years, 20 years old. I was out of my mind. See, well, you get disfigured when you've been abused. You get disfigured when people that should have loved you didn't. You get disfigured when you go pain after sorrow after pain after sorrow. It begins to disfigure you. And my men, I was so messed up by the time I got saved. I'm in the mental hospital. I'd take an antidepressant from the time I was 11 years old. I tried to take my own life at 15. And then I met the potter. <laughs> Then I met the wonderful, gracious, kind, magnificent potter who said, oh, come on, darling, climb back up on, I'll climb up onto this potter's wheel. I'll make something out of your life. Amen. Come on, look at your neighbor if you sit and say, if you stay on the wheel long enough, he'll make something glorious out of you. And he began to shape something from all the disfigurement that I'd gone through. He didn't cause it. Can if you hear anything I say this morning? God is not causing your disfigurement. God is not your problem this morning. He is your answer this morning. He is good all the time. And whatever happened to you in your life to cause you to be disfigured, he will take it and turn it to good. If you'll stay on the wheel... Have you ever met a Christian that climbed off the wheel too soon? <laughs> you know, you know, just, just thought, you know, but I don't want to stay on this wheel any longer. I've just had it. And then they just climb down off of it. It kind of looks like those pots you made in first grade. <laughs> you know, they're just kind of broken on one side and they're lopsided. And, you know, what half of it's up here, half of it's down here. And you're looking at that and you're like, what happened to that guy? Oh, he got off the wheel a little too early. <laughs> you got to stay on the potter's wheel if you want to see what he wants to make in your life. He's shaping you. He's molding you. I love that the potter's wheel is always in motion. See, God, serving God is not stagnant. If you think your relationship with God is boring, you need to spend a little bit more time with him. The potter's wheel is always in motion. God is always moving and active and speaking and doing and working. He's not boring. Welcome to the pot shop. And the potter knows how to deal with pressure. Our world does not know how to deal with pressure. Why do you think there are so many pot shops popping up all over the, our, our, our city? It's the world's idea of how to deal with pressure is to just numb your mind. And let me tell you something. If you think it's okay to smoke marijuana as a Christian, let me just send you a, a message from God today. You are not only smoking marijuana, you are opening a door to the demonic.
Don't shut me down when I'm preaching good. God's trying to help you today. He wants you to have a mind that can think clearly. You cannot do that with a pot pipe. God wants to shape your life into something. And if you are numbing your mind down by smoking marijuana, you have opened the door to the demonic and torment will come into your world. You have climbed off of the potter's wheel if you have picked up a pipe. Come on, somebody. And the Lord is not beating you over the head to punish you. He's saying, come on, I got something better for you than this. I know it's tough. I know there's pressure. Let me teach you how to deal with pressure in a godly way. Because he's the master potter. But I've hit a nerve this morning. I could feel it. You were all with me at the pot shop until I said you can't smoke it. (laughs) God understands that you have been under pressure. What he wants to do is teach you how to deal with it in a godly way. Because if you don't understand, there's always two different ways to deal with pressure. You will crack under the pressure or you will find God's way of escape. You will crack under the pressure or you will find God's way of escape. There is so much pressure in the world right now. I said that. Let me just give you a little bit of a list here. I I read this study. The biggest sources of stress. All right, listen to this, right? Pressure. Money, 69% of people are pressured with by, about money. 65% about their work. 61% about the economy. Family responsibilities, 57%. Relationships, 56%. Family health problems, 52%. And personal health concerns, 51%. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure on your pot. How do we deal with that kind of pressure? Would you like to know? Come back next week. (laughs) Isaiah 64, 8 says, But now, O Lord, you are our father, we are the clay, and you are the potter, we are the work of your hand. If the potter made your pot, don't you know he knows how to deliver you out of pressures that are crushing you? And this is the amazing thing about God. It's the, he'll say, you know, some things pressure comes on you, and he's like, I, I know they're under pressure. I know there's a lot going on. I'll just unveil some, pres- some treasure in the midst of their pressure. Has anyone ever been under pressure that actually unveiled treasure in your life? Do I have any parents in the house? How many of you asked for children? How many of you prayed for children? How many of you had no idea of the amount of pressure you were praying for? (laughs) I believed God for children for four and a half years. And God blessed us with three. And I didn't sleep for five years. (laughs) What? Because when God sometimes gives you something good in your life, we, we have to understand that sometimes pressure comes with it. Not all pressure is bad. Can I say that this morning? Some pressure just comes with the privileges of doing something great for God. Those babies God blesses you with, what a privilege to serve them. But oh my goodness, do they come with pressure. I, don't, I haven't found a manual yet that tells me exactly how to handle every single situation with my children. If you have one, please talk with me after service. Because though they are the greatest treasure, they're my greatest treasures other than serving God and my husband. My children are my greatest treasures, but they press, there's so much pressure right now on us on how to raise them, how to protect them. There are some pressures that we should put on our kids. They should have the pressure of responsibility. They should have the pressure of chores. How many of your kids do chores? Come on, somebody. I started giving all my kids zones. This is your zone, this is your zone, this is your zone. And when I put Liza in in charge of something, that toilet, she is going to guard that thing and make sure it's clean because it's her zone. Pressure of responsibility is a good thing. There are some pressures you should not be putting on your children. We should not be putting the pressure on our children to be perfect. I understand that as pastors, you know, people talk about to us about the living in a fishbowl. Well, living in a fishbowl because you're in the public eye or whether you own a business, you're in the public eye or or you're in the government in the public eye, you're in some kind of public eye position, that's a privilege. 
if you're a leader this morning listening to me somewhere, the fishbowl is a privilege. And I understand it comes with pressure. But anything worth doing is going to have pressure attached to it. You've got to be prepared for some areas of pressure and count it as a privilege of serving God. But living in a fishbowl, I've decided that I will never put the pressure of being perfect on my children. I've heard too many horror stories of, of pastor's kids that, that were raised to feel like they had to be perfect. Has anyone in the house figured out that my kids aren't perfect yet? <laughs> As proved by the night Pastor Craig Schlesinger was preaching here, and I was guarding the nursery because my husband, my husband, oh gosh, my son had pulled off his pants, he's standing in his pull-up, I, and I'm guarding him, and I did, I'm just guarding the nursery, and I close my eyes to worship for a minute, and he comes streaking down the aisle. <laughs> my kids aren't perfect. We cannot put that kind of pressure on our children, nor can we put the pressure on our children of them living out our unfulfilled dreams. Come on, somebody. Let your children discover what God has put in them with you helping them. Find out what God put in them. Don't try to make them. Don't put your children, your grandchildren up on the potter's wheel and start trying to shape them yourself. Come on, somebody. God is the potter of their clay. God has a plan for them. You pray and find out, God, how do I partner with you to watch you develop in my children, my grandchildren, what you've called them to be, what you're making them into, and I'll help you however I can. I had decided that Eliza should take two years of piano lessons because that was my plan. She'd only taken one. And I went to the Lord and the Lord said to me, I want you to let her decide if she's going to take the next, piano, the next year of piano lessons. Well, I didn't really like that idea. Because <laughs> I'm a woman with a plan. I got A, B, C, D, and that doesn't work. I got E, F, G. Come on, I like a plan. But he said, let Eliza decide if she wants to go back to piano lessons. What is he doing? I'm the potter, Cammie. I'm the potter. Let me shape people into what I've called them to be. Come on, ladies. You know you can't shape your husband into what you want him to be. Come on, somebody. Don't shout me down when I preach a good God's hands are on that man. Your job is not to make him into what he's supposed to be. Your job is to get on your knees and pray out what he's supposed to be. Your job is not to criticize him into what he's supposed to be. Your job is to find a way to build him into the man of God that God is working on and making him and shaping him and molding him. If you want to see him climb off the potter's wheel, you just start criticizing everything that he does. You just start pointing out everything that's wrong with your man and watch him climb off the potter's wheel so fast you weren't sure what would happen. But God, I pray for him. I'm just telling him all he could be. <laughs> you want to see a man climb up onto the potter's wheel. You start respecting him. You start telling him what you see in him. You start telling him how much you honor him as the man of God in your life. <laughs> watch him climb back shrug his shoulders a little bit, climb back up onto that potter's wheel because he feels like you value him. You're not breaking him down. Amen? So back to my story, Eliza came up to me and after she prayed and I told her, I want you to, to decide if you're going back to piano lessons because God told me to do that. And she comes back and she said, I want to play the fiddle. I think her grandpa had been fasting and praying for 40 days <laughs> to get this into that child. I'm kidding. But it was in her. All right, she wants to play the fiddle. So we get her into the lessons. We find out it's $75 for lessons for the whole year. Piano lessons are expensive. This was a blessing that I wasn't even expecting. You've got to let God make and mold your children on the potter's wheel. That potter's wheel is always in motion. It's always moving. It's not stagnant. If you feel like your life is stagnant, like you're not going anywhere, like you're stuck, like you're not sure that God has even acted in your life, you need to make sure that you have not climbed off the wheel. Well, I'm just bored, my relationship with God. Have you talked to him today? Have you asked him what's on his mind? Have you
Have you read his word? His mercy is new every morning, and he's shaping your pie into something new every day that you're willing to work with him. It's exciting to let the master mold you. It's a good thing. Hallelujah. What kind, of, what kind of pots are we anyway? Look at your neighbor and say, what kind of pot are you? What kind of pot are you? Second Corinthians chapter 4. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. This is what kind of pot you are this morning. Are you ready for this? For it is God, it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed. Somebody say pressure. On every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body, in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Hallelujah. What kind of pot are you? You are a earthen vessel. You are a jar of clay. You are, if you will, a crack pot. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. That word for vessel is ostrakinos. It literally means broke, breakable, fragile Corinthian pottery. Your outside pot is pretty fragile, have you noticed? I mean, you've got to wash it every day. You've got to scrub it. You've got to take care of it. You eat one bag of potato chips and you pay for it for two months. Come on, your, your, your jar of clay, your outside pot is pretty fragile. But oh, what's inside of you? We have this treasure in earthen vessels. What treasure? The knowledge of the glory of God is on the inside of your cracked pot. The knowledge of the glory of God means that the presence of God, he doesn't wait until you have it all together to pour his treasure into you. He doesn't wait till you've been on the wheel for long enough and said, all right, now I'll pour my presence into you. No, the minute you climb upon the potter's wheel and say, God, make me, mold me, shape me, he begins to work into you and he pours his anointing, his treasure, his presence inside of you. We have this treasure in earthen vessels and we are under quite a lot of pressure. I love that, uh, I, I like treasure days more than I like crackpot days. I really do. I like treasure days. I mean, treasure maps are popular at my house. Where you send your kids on some kind of treasure, where you write out all the clues, and you say, you know, go, go to this spot and answer this riddle, and, and then they find a clue, you know, on the tire of the car, and, or they find a clue in the mailbox, and they find a clue, the next clue, they go and they look, and, and they, oh, that, that clue's in the wheelbarrow, and they get so excited. Have you ever been on a treasure hunt? Right? Anybody been on treasure hunt? Yeah. Treasures are exciting. Yeah. I like treasure days. I like when God reveals to me some treasure on the inside of me through prayer. Some answer that I didn't know what to do. Sometimes you have to dig out the treasure that God is trying to reveal to you. I like treasure days. I like days where I feel like I'm walking in victory. I like days where I feel like God is speaking to me so clearly. I like days where treasures are just being unveiled and I'm, well, God's showing up here and God's showing up there and God's bringing breakthrough in this person's life. I like treasures when I go to God and ask him about some situation. Being a pastor, you know, everybody says such nice things about you all the time. <laughs> you know? Or accuse you of, of things that, that are so painful that you're, you, 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 if you take it on the outside of your crack pot, you'll just crack. Pastors really do have feelings. I think my husband does somewhere. <laughs> that man is an ox. He's a warrior. Sometimes I just look at him and say, honey, I'm just, you're just a warrior. Thank you for carrying all of us. Thank you for pushing forward. He doesn't even tell you the, some of the stuff he deals with. Sometimes I look at his phone and I, I think I need to go to the pot shop. 
a joke. <laughs> Why? Because he guards me. He protects me from some things that I'm like, what? In the, yeah, all this was going on last week. Yeah, I didn't want to tell you about that. I didn't want you to be concerned about it. What is that? That's a man of a pastor being a covering over his wife, over his family, over his children. That man's a warrior. But I'm, I'm a crackpot. I pressure sit, being more sensitive to what people say about us or, or you know, people accuse us of something. And I'm like, Lord, that is so painful. I remember one time I had to correct somebody. You know, I don't really like correcting people. The Lord's been dealing with me about being more bold about correcting people, so watch out. Because <laughs> I like friends. I like having fr friends. I, uh, the pressure of people wanting to like you is real. And so uh, when somebody says something that's painful, or I remember one time I had to bring a correction to somebody, and I went to the Lord, and I wept all through, almost all through the night because he was asking me to do something that I knew was going to be really challenging and painful for somebody that I loved. And I wept all through the night, and, and, it, and I went, and I did what he asked me to do, and months later I asked God about that, and I, and I, I began to dig up pre treasure inside of me because I began to, Lord, this is so painful. God, this hurts so much. God, my, my pot is cracking under this pressure of feeling rejected and misunderstood and unwanted, and I get in the presence of God, and you begin to dig out that treasure when the Lord speaks to you and says, no, actually, I'm going to decide, this is the Lord, this is the Lord. I, I'm just going to bless you double for what you just went through. Amen. Actually, you did exactly what I asked you to, and because you were obedient, I'm going to pour out a double blessing. I'm just going to give you more than I was planning on. Planning on. That's treasure. That's when you don't understand a situation. And you go to the Lord and you're feeling crushed under the pressure of the weight of your job, the weight of your relationship, the weight of your ministry, the weight of people's opinions. And you feel like you're about to crack. Has anyone else ever cracked? I know none of you went to the pot shop because I know, I know better than that. One time I walked into a grocery store and a powerful woman of God, I won't mention names, powerful woman of God that I love dearly. And I walked into the grocery store and she was standing in front of all the alcohol. And it's so fun being a pastor because I walk in and she looked this really big, her eyes got really big and she said, oh, I don't drink. <laughs> and inside I thought, oh, I love this woman. Of course I know you don't drink. She was buying something to cook with. But how many Christians feel the pressure of alcohol, the pressure to numb the pain, the pressure to just escape from what you're dealing with, where you feel like you're about to crack? That's when you begin to have to dig out the treasure. God says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. You're going to have to deal with the pressure on your pot, but God says I've given you treasure to dig out to help you find the answers when you feel broken, when you have an ostrakinos day, breakable, fragile, Corinthian prottery that feels like you're about to crack. Do I have any parents in the room that have prayer time hiding in the bathroom? You know what I'm talking about. When you escape for five minutes to get alone with God and start to dig out treasure before you get asked for 15 snacks. You've got to find place. If you are exhausted, if you are a workaholic in the house today, and you feel like you're about to crack under the pressure to produce for your family, that pressure is real. You've got to begin to remind yourself, wait a minute, it's the potter who's shaping my family. It's the potter who's my provider. It's the potter who says, if I stay on the wheel, he will take care of my life. If I seek first the kingdom of God, all these things will be added unto me. It's the potter who has promised to take care of you. And if you think all that pressure is on you to provide for your family in your own strength, you will crack. You will crack. Look at your neighbor and say, that's too much pressure. I picture like a soda can just being crushed. You can't hold that kind of pressure. You've got treasure on you, but you can't put all that pressure to produce in your family and take it on yourself. 
God wants you to be, climb back up on the potter's wheel and let him shape and mold you and says, I will provide for you. I'll take care of you. You keep me first and all these other things will be added unto you. That's a pressure release. That's a pressure release. We're not called to be workaholics. We can't work our way into solving out all of our problems. We're called to work hard. You're called to work six days a week. And on the seventh day, God rested. How many people have I seen crash and burn because they want to work seven days a week and try to get ahead? You can't work that hard. It's too much pressure. You can never produce what God will multiply and produce on your behalf if you will honor him with one day a week. He will take what you give him and multiply it and, and cause you to have enough because you kept him first. If you try to take all the pressure on yourself and work yourself into an early grave and your heart is to provide for your family, I understand. But God says, I have a different way of doing that. Put me first and I'll take care of your family. Put me first and I'll provide for you. Put me first and I'll multiply your seed sown. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, I don't know if anybody was under more pressure in the Bible than Jacob. You know, all know the story of Jacob? Jacob's name means trickster, swindler. Jacob was born into pressure. I want to talk today about four pressures. Nobody look at the clock. Four pressures. We'll hit them, we'll hit them. Four pressures that I feel like God wants to bring release to and turn to treasure in the pot shop today, all right? We're in the pot shop. Four pressures that God wants to unveil treasure in your life. You ready? All out of the life of, life of Jacob. Jacob was born into pressure. You find his story in Genesis where, where he is in this, the womb of his mother, Rebecca, and Rebecca has been crying out for a baby, and God hears her prayer, and she gets pregnant with twins. And inside her twin, in her body, she's carrying twins that are Esau and Jacob. And there's fighting going on inside her womb, and it gets so intense that she goes to the Lord, and she says, what is going on? And the Lord says this to her. I want to read it. I want to just quote it. Genesis 23 says, And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Now, even if you are inside, I want you to imagine you are Jacob inside Rebecca's womb this morning. You're living in there with your brother that is having a wrestling match with you. And even though you may not even be old enough to hear the noises outside the womb, let me tell you something, baby spirits can hear everything. Your spirit can hear everything from God from the time of conception. Because don't you know life begins at conception, Amen. And those babies matter. And those babies' spirits are aware of what God is saying over them. So here's Jacob, and he hears that. Oh, the older is going to serve me. Oh, I've got a great call of leadership on my life. Even from the womb. And they begin to fight, and they begin to struggle, and they begin to wrestle. Somebody say pressure. And so much so that when they're born... Esau busts out first, and the Bible says that Jacob grabs onto Esau's heel, and it's just hanging on for dear life. Somebody pray for the nursery, amen? <laughs> Pressure! All's good. He's hanging on to his heel for dear life. Jacob has this word prophesied over him that he's going to do something great for God, and he's born into Pressure. From his earliest age, the pressure, here's the first pressure, the pressure to be important. The pressure to be important. If any time has our generation been pressured to be important, it is now. Because, I mean, I don't know about you, but I see people posting things just, just you know, well, this was the breakfast I ate. Pancakes. And this is, you know, the pressure to feel important. And now we have a whole generation that's trying to post their whole life trying to feel important. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. I'm not against Facebook. I use Facebook as a tool. But let me tell you something. If you're using social media to try and feel important, it can slowly slip into idolatry. Facebook can't make you feel important. 
I don't care if you have 4,000 likes. Only God can make you feel important. Did you know as a Christian that you're allowed to have needs? Did you know as a Christian serving God on fire, on the potter's wheel, you are allowed to have needs in your soul? We are not called to just squash down everything about us and pretend we don't have any needs, any pain, need anything. We're just going to press forward and serve God. And I love your heart to serve. Keep serving God. But you are allowed to have needs. And one of the needs you have is to feel important. And the pressure to feel important will either push you towards God or it'll push you towards social media to post what your pancakes were, post how you, you know, you clean your dog for three hours, post how you went, you know, uh, and read four books, post everything of your life trying to feel important from people that cannot make you feel important. Look at your neighbor if you would say, you will never be more important than you are right now. No degree. I'm just talking now. <laughs> no degree, no relationship, no spouse, no having babies, no having a ministry, no PhD behind your name, no, no how many your career takes off. You will never be more important to God, to the potter, than you are right now at this very moment because he calls you his. Do not waste your life trying to get something that you already have. You're already important. He already knows how many hairs are on your head. He already knows how many you've lost. He already knows. That rippled, that rippled over, sorry. He already knows what he put in you. See, God is not overly concerned about the pressure on you because he knows what he put in you. And if you'll dig out that treasure of God, I know that you say I'm important, so I don't have to try to feel important by the rest of the world and slip into idolatry of trying to get a need met that can never satisfy me. You have a need to have attention that is healthy and normal. You have a healthy need of attention. And if you try to get it made through the world, if you try to get it met by, by the world's way of doing things, it'll become this exhaustion. But oh, when you go before God and you look up at heaven, you have to understand that all of God's attention is right on you. You have all the attention from your creator, from your maker who loves you, that you will ever need. You have his attention. He loves to listen to you. He loves to talk with you. Before I was married, I used to set two teacups out. I haven't done this in a while. I probably should. I used to set tea, two, two teacups out the table and just sit there and have tea with Jesus. And I would just practice talking to him and listening to him and fellowshipping with him and enjoying him and hearing his sense of humor and hearing him reveal things to me. What was I doing? I needed his attention. And when you give him, there, did you see that? I just I did that again. If you're at the women's conference, you know. When you give him your attention, you have all of his attention. And you begin to dig out treasure that he wants to reveal to you. The pressure to feel important is a very real pressure. And if you don't get it met in Jesus, your pot will begin to crack. You'll feel it begin to push down on you. We gotta teach a generation how to feel important in a healthy way. we got to teach a generation that other people and social media cannot give that to you, but God can give that to you. And if you get to know him, he'll reveal to you that he had a plan in store for you from the foundation of the world, and he wants you to come and listen to all that he wants to do in your life. Amen. You have his attention, the pressure to be important. Jacob and Esau grow up, and of course Esau is the hairy one, the strong one, the, the, the fighter, the, the, the hunter, the great one that goes out, and his daddy loves him. Isaac loves Jacob as they grow up, and Jacob's more mild-mannered, he's more uh, uh, calmer, he likes to hang out in the kitchen with his mama with a spatula, 
And it doesn't look like what God has declared and prophesied is ever going to come to pass. And so Rachel and Jacob come up with this plan that they're going to trick Isaac from not giving the blessing to Esau. They want the blessing to go to Jacob. And the pressure comes on them to try and make happen what only God can make happen. Have you ever tried to make something happen only that God can make happen? That's a lot of pressure. And they trick Jacob. They trick Isaac into giving Jacob the blessing. He dresses up in like this hairy, it's really kind of odd, you know, he dresses up in this, this hairy, hairy stuff so he feels like Esau and he goes into his daddy and his daddy ends up giving him the blessing that was going to go to Jacob. And when Esau finds out that, that his blessing has been stolen, he's red hot mad as a hornet. And here we find what pressure is after right here. What does Jacob do when Esau is mad as a hornet? This is what pressure is after. This is what pressure is trying to get you to do. It's trying to get you to run. Pressure that comes on you, the spiritual warfare that I deal with before I preach, or really any time, but especially before I preach, the pressure of the spiritual warfare, if you can know you're experiencing spiritual warfare at a pretty high level when you feel pressure to run from something. That is what it's trying to get you to do. Run. Run from your job. It's too much pressure. I can't take this. It's too much pressure to work in this place any longer. Has God put you there? Because if God's put you there, he's put something in you to sustain you. God will never put you in a place, even where there's pressure, without giving you what you need to sustain you and bring victory into the situation. Your job is to stay on the wheel. Your job is to stay up there letting God shape you and make you. Jesus understood that kind of pressure in the garden. Pressure like none of us have ever experienced. When the Bible says that he literally bled great, great drops of blood. He knew he was going to the cross. Pressure. Pressure. And I love how Jesus dealt with that pressure because he says, Father, if there's any other way this cup pass for me, Let this pass for me if there's any other way. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And angels come and minister to him. And Jesus gets strengthened and encouraged. You know, when you stay the course, even in the midst of pressure, and you say, God, this feels like a lot of pressure. This feels like too much for me. I just want to run. I just want to get on a cruise ship. I just want to sail far away. You are under spiritual warfare, and if you stay the course, God is working on unveiling, turning your pressure into treasure. Do not break it and run off and miss what God is trying to do. Pressure wants to make you run. Well, this marriage is getting too difficult. This relationship's too hard. I I had a man come to my husband once. The pressure was so strong. uh, He was having challenges with his wife. And he told my husband, well, I had a vision. And God showed him he was going to give him a new wife. (laughs) True story. Let me tell you something. The Bible would call that adultery. You can't. we, We don't have an exchange rate. Can I get a new model, God? Can I exchange this one, God? Can you take this one back and give me a different one? No, that's called adultery. But the pressure was so heavy on his relationship that the pressure was telling him to run. Now, if you're in an abusive situation, if you're in an actual adultery situation, I'm not, I'm not talking to you. There's situations where God allows divorce. If you've been through a divorce this morning, you can climb onto that wheel. God will take what you've been through and make something beautiful out of it. That's not the unpardonable sin. You can be absolutely forgiven and cleansed of any mistake you've made, and God won't even and put you down for it. In fact, he'll forgive you and never bring it up to you again. Just climb it back up on the wheel. Let him shape you, make you, and mold you. But pressure wants you to run. You've got to recognize that. Has anyone in the last two weeks felt pressure to run from something? Raise your hand. Pressure to run from something. Run and just get out. 
Recognize that for spiritual warfare and instead begin to pray, God, not my will, but yours be done. And allow the Spirit of God and the angels of the Lord to come and minister to you because you're staying the course. God will see you through. Amen? Amen. Can you give him a big clap offering this morning? <laughs> Pressure. Pressure to be important. The pressure to finish my message. <laughs> when I have three more points. Yes, Lord. I'm just going to name the other pressures. I'm not even going to go into them because I have some words for people that I want to share before two o'clock. Welcome to the pot shop. Pressure that God wants to unveil into treasure. The pressure to be important. The pressure to produce. I, I touched on that one. Don't put all that on yourself. God wants to multiply your seed sown. Don't think it's all your job to produce everything you need for your family. Man of God. Man of God. You are a provider, but you are not a multiplier. Oh, I'm going to say it again. You are a provider, but you are not a multiplier. And you can work hard. We have hardworking men in this church. But you cannot work and multiply the way God can multiply what you offer him in your life. You work hard and keep God first and watch him multiply what you need in your family. Amen? Amen? The pressure to be important. The pressure to produce. Hallelujah. Pressure to remember what the other pressure was. <laughs> yes, Lord. No, it's just, I want to read these words, and I feel like he's not wanting me to go into this, so I'm not going to go into it deep, but I thought he'd at least let me say them. The pressure, I've never had that happen like that. The pressure to produce, the pressure to be important. What was the other one, Lord? I preached this whole thing to myself. Now I really want to read it to you. Just talk amongst yourselves for a second. <laughs> See, in the old days, this would have bothered me, but I, don't, I just, I've gotten over that. And so I, I, I'd rather really tell it to you than feel like I did a great job. Isn't that freedom? <laughs> Lord Jesus. Yes, pressure can produce pearls or pressure can produce problems depending on how we respond to it. We did that. Pressure to be important. We did that. Pressure to run. Midlife crisis pressure. Pressure of parenting. Oh, that's a good one, yeah. <laughs> the pressure of difficult people. No wonder the devil doesn't want me to tell you that. <laughs> See, I, honestly, the olden days, I would have just skipped it. and I was too quiet. I don't like quiet. But seriously, the pressure of difficult people can crush you. Jacob experienced all kinds of difficult people, mostly Laban. You know the story when he went to, when he gets Rachel to marry him and Laban, you know, messes with his wages 10 times and Jacob's in love with Rachel. This is after he runs. This is after he flees. Now he's in his midlife crisis and pressure at midlife is a whole lot different than pressure in your younger years. We kind of get over one to be important, right? Who's over that? <laughs> But in midlife, there's a whole different kind of pressure and dealing with difficult people is what Jacob is facing in his life. And he falls in love with Rachel, the shepherdess. And Laban tricks him and he thinks he's marrying Rachel. Right? He worked for Leah, uh, Rachel for seven years and Laban tricks him and he marries Leah. How many of that's a lot of pressure if you wake up one morning and you realize you married the wrong person? That's a problem. He wakes up and there's Leah. Pressure. Dealing with.
with Laban, this difficult man, where he lives there for 20 years. Laban says, well, you can work seven more years and I'll give your Rachel too. Pressure. Laban is changing his wages all over the place. This is a difficult person to deal with. Some people are not a thorn in your side. They are a whole bush. And they're living in the same house, the same place. And for 20 years, Jacob has to learn how to deal with a difficult person. The pressure of difficult people. Jesus sets the most beautiful example of how to deal with difficult people. And it's not punch them. And it's not tell the whole church that we need to pray for this person and tell all about how they're so difficult. Come on, somebody. That's called gossip. That's not let's pray for this person. That's called gossip. That's called, the Bible says to avoid, you know, confront a divisive person. Correct them one time. Correct them two times. The Bible says after that, don't have anything to do with them. Wow, there's a word. A divisive person is working for the devil. A divisive person is trying to get you to separate from people God has put in your life. That's a hard word. Correct them once, correct them twice. After that, have nothing to do with them. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. Now, a divisive person has an agenda. I'm not talking about the nice little difficult person that, you know, has some issues. I'm talking about someone who has an agenda that is trying to cause division. The Bible says, correct them once, correct them twice, then have nothing to do with them until they repent. That guards your own pot from pressure. Jesus set the example of how to deal with difficult people when he said if they slap you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. Jesus told, tells us how to deal with difficult people because he prayed beforehand. If you're going to go into a situation of a difficult person, don't look at your spouse right now. Right? Pray beforehand. Be prayed up before you're going to go into the situation to talk with them and deal with them. Jesus forgave people even before they apologized. Well, I'll forgive them when they apologize for that. That may never happen. <laughs> Set yourself free from the pressure of difficult people by forgiving them before they apologize. And somebody said amen. amen. Jesus set the example of dealing with difficult people by not letting the pressure of people get on the inside of him. He learned how to respond to his father instead of reacting to people. If you have a difficult person in your life, learn to recognize what God is saying and how to re respond instead of react to them. To diffuse a difficult situation. All right, I'm going to read these words for people. It's 1245. I get all, you guys all get on my husband for preaching long. I'm in trouble. A <laughs> couple of people I don't see. Melissa Pluer is not here. I will share this to you. If you're watching online, I have a word for you. Selena. Selena here? Selena, will you stand up? I have this word for you. I want to read it to you. <clears throat> this is what I felt the Lord saying to you. I saw you on a hot air balloon. And I felt the Lord say he will be revealing to you his fun side. That you've experienced him in many ways and that he's going to be revealing to you his fun side, his playful side. There were things of a serious nature that you had to deal with from a young age. And God is restoring to you parts of childhood, the lightheartedness, the sense of carefreeness, of adventure. He's restoring that to you. And part of that is him revealing to you he's not only interested in your growth, he's also interested in your ability to enjoy him. Hallelujah. He also told me to tell you that he is so proud of you. Amen. Can you give God a hand clap for that? Amen. Where's Bobby? Bobby, I have a word for you. Will you stand up for a second? Bless you, Bobby. Bobby, I saw two angels walking on either side of you in my prayer time. And the Lord says there is great protection over your life. And because of the pureness of your heart motives, God has issued angels an assignment of protection over others to be sure because of your prayer life, it affects the protection of those around you. And just as God said about Nathaniel, behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile, so he says about you, Bobby, behold a man whom there is no guile. 
Your prayers are a ministry and assignment over this house and beyond. And today, Father God, we pray a fresh prophetic insight into your prayer time and a fresh joy in the assignment. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Father, we pray over Bobby, and we thank you for the pureness of his heart and his service to you. And God, I pray that you would grant him the desires of his heart in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Just a, just a couple more. I have um, just a couple more. Daniel, where's Kayla's wife? Is he in the nursery? You want to grab him? Can he be spared? I'm going gonna, gonna to read Chanel's. I know she's probably listening online. Chanel, if you're online, I'm going to read this word to you. I heard, Chanel, I heard hell screaming when your feet touched the floor in the morning. <laughs> And I felt the Lord say, she is a Deborah in the making. Then I saw God hand you a ring of keys, gold keys. And he said, this is a time of learning to operate well in the keys of the kingdom. I saw doors like a hallway in front of you. And you looked up at the doors and back at your keys. And I felt the Lord say, doors of opportunity will open in due season. And when that happens, you'll be ready because you took the time to be trained well in use of the keys. Don't rush the process. It's vital to where you're headed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. One more. Daniel, I have a word for you the Lord gave me when I was praying. Can I share this with you? Daniel, I saw you standing beneath a giant, ancient-looking pear tree, and you were picking fruit from the tree and putting it in a bucket. And I heard the Lord say, Daniel is a harvester. Daniel has the ability to find use in just about anything. He sees how things can be redeemed and made useful. What others might throw away, Daniel has insight and ability to to say, no, wait, that could be used for something good. That still has value. Daniel likes to feel useful as well. He's a problem solver and carries insight into practical issues that produce fruit in people's lives. And the Lord said, today I'm releasing fresh insight, fresh strategies, and even ideas of invention to bring practical answers to those around him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's all stand this morning. I'm way over time. Hallelujah. We're on God's time. Amen. Can I get the musicians to come up? Thank you, James. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Welcome to the pot shop. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands to heaven this morning. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Father, I thank you right now, Father God, for every person that's been under pressure. God, that you would reveal to them the treasure that you're unveiling in their life, God. Though they're walking through pressure, you provide the correct way of escape. You provide the treasure they're looking for. You provide the answer that they need. God, that not all pressure means they're out of the will of God. Sometimes pressure means you're just unveiling more treasure. And so, God, we say right now in the name of Jesus, not our will, but yours be done, God. We will stay the course. We will stay on the potter's will. We will stay, Father God, as you mold us and shape us shape us into what you've called us to be. We thank you that you don't throw us out, God. You just make us into something brand new. And where we think we've missed it, you say, I'll just give you something better. And where we think something was stolen from us, you say, you'll restore it. And where we think we're too disfigured and too marred, you just shape us into something that you've always had in mind. God, we give you honor and praise for it right now in the name of Jesus. If you're here this morning, And you say, I just need prayer. I'm not sure I can take this kind of pressure. I'd like to invite you up this morning. We're going to pray for some people. If you're here this morning and you say, I need direction in my life. I need to know i got to make some decisions. There's some people in the house. You've got to make some decisions on what to do. Some of these decisions might be major life decisions. If that's you this morning, would you come down? Because God is going to release wisdom and treasure into your spirit this morning. God doesn't always show you the whole path. Sometimes it's just the next step. And those of you that are looking to make big decisions, God is going to show you the next step in your life. I want to invite you down this morning. We're going to pray over you this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If you need healing in your body, please come down this morning. We're going to pray for you as well. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you.